Part of our mission at Diamond uh, is to get kids' life ready. Right? It's so much more than the math, the English. Right? It's getting kids ready for life. Because when you hit 18, these kids are going out on their own. And if you don't understand it, if you make mistakes along the way, it can set you back. So it's better to be prepared and be ready for the challenges and transitions that are coming. And that's why we're here today. The reason we're here today is to inform you to be prepared for the next step. So I truly appreciate you all being here. This can only prepare you better, get you more ready for the future. So uh, I'm very, very uh, excited to announce our first presenter. Um, and, and this is what we do here. We want to prepare you by bringing in the best uh, people to inform you about it. Uh, and the first person uh, is uh, our district attorney, Thomas Quinn, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about what to expect legally once your child turns 18, once they leave high school. Mr. Quinn, thank you. Good morning. Happy to be here today. Good to be in the company of people. One, two years. So um, I don't want to have a, I'm the district attorney in charge of overseeing the prosecution of cases throughout county, Bristol County. Um, I have a soft spot for young people. Uh, we all make mistakes in life. But it's about moving forward if you can. So I think some of the some of the things. 18 is when you become a legal adult for uh, the criminal law purpose. It used to be 17 when I first started. So it used to be 17 for, for in the criminal justice system. You could be charged as an adult. Which I never understood, to be honest with you. Yeah, I've been involved almost 35 years, so I don't know when they came up with that. But that was changed at 18. So if you're viewed as a juvenile up until 18, and you know, some people get involved in matters, and that's how things go. For the most part, if you, if you are involved with a crime in juvenile, as a juvenile, that is not public. So that's not going to follow you for the rest of your life, unless it's a serious offense. I don't really want to discuss those matters, but very serious crime, you can be charged as a youth offender and that is a public man. Um, but for the most part, as it should be, it, under most circumstances, we make mistakes. We're young, we're immature, we get caught up in groups, we do things. It's addressed, we want to move forward. But when you become 18, the confidentiality is gone. Now, it, let me just say this in a mic. The military potentially could look into juvenile matter or if you're trying to get security clearance, but that's the way that's the way it is. But for the most part again, it's not going to follow you. And it, and it should. If I get into an incident myself, and I'll be a day that that's supposed to follow you for the rest of your life, no. When we become 18, it's public. Now uh, it's changed over the years, but they used to cover a lot of this these things more and more. They get used to have an arrest log of people but they don't do that anymore. So once you're 18, uh, even though you're an adult, you can vote. You can go be, you don't have a draft, but that used to be the military draft. Uh, you cannot purchase or use alcohol until 21. People do, obviously. Uh, but, you know, it is against the law, or it's not, and when alcohol is abused and used, many tragedies flow from it. So you can flow when you're under 18. But I believe, I'm not sure because this is not kind of purchasing t tobacco, I think it's 21, but we don't you know, really get involved with that. And marijuana, which you know the, you can purchase in some cases, uh, that possession of marijuana is not a crime. Uh, but the point is, you become 18, the juvenile protections are gone, and if you get involved in something, uh, that could follow you. No, again, 18, 17, 19, 20, 21, we're all, you know, we're all at that stage in our life in a vulnerable situation in terms of maturity and things, but you just have to be aware 
that if you go to college or if you're out on your own, even at your home, those things can have more significance. Unfortunately, I would, I would say this in terms uh, of the social media, everybody's familiar with it, has got their phones. There's some good aspects to it, but the abuse of those devices that can also cause you problems. Uh, there are crimes associated with that, especially when you become an, an, an uh, adult, as I said. So I think, just as an aside, you've got to be careful with that stuff, okay? It's, it's out of control, frankly, how it's used, slandering people and doing other things. But, um, so just be aware that juvenile, confidential, over 18 now, that's a public matter. You get involved in something, you're trying to get a job, they can do a check on, the, on your record. Um, it may or may not impact them. They're looking for people to work now, so uh, it, from what we uh, understand. So just be aware of that. Um, I was asked to touch on a couple of things really not in my area, but you know, you become 18, you, you're involved with a physician, a doctor, if the parents are out, uh, unless you want to bring them in and consult. But the, there are privacy rights. Uh, it, it's a, like many things, it's a balancing test. I mean, your parents are still there to care for you and support you, so uh, I think from your own perspective, cutting them out it may not be a good idea. I'm not getting into it, but there's a school aspect of it too, of privacy with grades. Once you get to 18, so I'm paying for somebody to go to school, all of a sudden they flunk out <laughs> in May. So, we were chatting a little mixed bag to that. I'm not getting into that where um, it'd be nice to have some idea of what's going on, right? If you're paying especially big money for the child to go to school, on the other hand, there's these privacy interests. Because to some extent, they use the term rate, the pat rate of passage, certain things. So you're 18, you're moving on into your adult life. There's responsibilities that come with it. Uh, so you just have to be careful about that. It doesn't mean things aren't going to happen. And again, we all make mistakes. I'm sympathetic to that, you know, to, to a lot of them. But uh, they can have ramifications. Um, in fact, with respect to some of these medical issues, that I heard recently even in, Another state of getting into it, I think, when at 16, I was in some type of medical issue. The parent did not have a right to have the information uh, about this interaction with a, a, a call it a medical professional. But those are different states and different laws. So you're given by 18 responsibility, right? Out of high school, moving forward, college, working world, living on your own or living but responsibilities come with that and there can be consequences from that. Again, as a DA, I'm very sympathetic to people making mistakes and trying to move forward with their life. Some things obviously you know, much more serious than others. So um, I think that's really made me didn't realize from our 18 adult juvenile protections are gone and there can be more consequences or ramifications for if you get involved in some things after 18 that could impact you during your life. Hopefully you can move past it. So um, I think that in my time frame, that was it. Is there anything else you'd like me to touch on? Uh, Are there any, so the DA's not going to stay with us today, but if there's any minutes, specific questions, does anybody have any other questions? Sometimes things come up more situationally that we get a lot, but you would be the expert to ask now. Yeah, if you, if you do, if I can answer it, that's fine. So, I never, you understand what I'm talking about, the juvenile, like if you get charged, it's a different terminology, delinquency, but if you get charged with a crime, or a, when you're under 18, that's in the juvenile court, and again, there are privacy protections there. You can't comment on who the person is, you know, that, that's private, which is a good thing. Absent, as I said, a serious, matter, but I think we don't need to get into that now. Yeah. Could you um, perhaps leave an email in case parents have questions they'd like to ask that they're not comfortable asking here? Or is there someone in your office? Yeah, that sure. You could, uh, sure uh, I, can leave it. I can leave my email and follow the questions. Uh, sure. But yeah, if you, uh, 
Yeah, if you don't feel comfortable, that's, that's fine. I'll leave some information. Oh, fine. I just figured it. Not you personally, anyway. No. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, I I don't, it's, it's, it's tough to be the first one to raise question. the hand. You know, it's just, I'm just trying to give some indication that, again, from my perspective, when you turn 18, who are an adult, uh, as I said, it was interesting to a good part of my career was 17. You know what I'm saying? If you were 17, I never, again, I never understood that. I mean, honestly, how they arrived at that. Because they're saying you're an adult at 17, and here, you, you could be drafted at 18. So I, I'm kind of, I'm glad they changed that, to be honest with you. Uh, this was a few years back. Again, yeah, more serious crimes, you can still be dealt with as an adult. But, uh, okay, if there's someone in your office, I'm sure you're very busy. So even if there's someone in your office, yeah. so I respond though if it's brought to my attention. You know, well, I have someone responding. Yeah. So we do have a representative here too from Pat Eagle Mike, just from the DA's office. Oh, so she'll, yeah. be, she'll be here till the end. April's going to be here to the end, so you can chat with April. And if she, why don't we do that? Uh, if you have some questions, you can get information to her that you want. That she can't answer it, and um, uh, you know, either via phone or email. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I wish you luck going forward. In, in a sense, it's a, uh, it's kind of a, you know, you, you, 18 is kind of a passage out of high school into another life. You've been, you know, with friends or people, parents, and then now you're moving on. What are you doing? So, uh, for all of us, life's about moving forward. If this year you get it, we all have ups and downs, but try to step back and move forward and work out for you. Okay? All right. So next, uh, we have Lois Miller, who is our director of guidance and advisory. She's going to speak more specifically to the legal aspects of education, FERPA, those types of things. So she has a little more specialty in that area. All right, so those of you who are going on to college, parents, if you don't know this yet, you will soon. At 18, so there's a lot, it's called FERPA. Anybody heard of FERPA before? So it's in our student handbooks, right? And, and it's supposed to be on all education uh, websites and their handbooks and everything. A lot of people don't know what FERPA is, but it is a law to protect students' privacy of so their educational records. Until they're 18, their parent has the right. Once you turn 18, and I'm going to give you like a little exception here. Once you turn 18 and you're in an educational institution, the educational institution does not have to share any of your records. So report cards, things like that. So sometimes parents are like, oh, I'm paying all this money. Why do I not get to see this information? I am going to suggest students that you work as partners with your parents. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> because sometimes we get this thing in our head, well, we're 18, we know everything. You don't. Not yet. You're still learning. At my age, I'm still learning, right? So you want to take advantage of the wisdom of your elders and your parents. So there's like there is an exception, which is really interesting, to FERPA. FERPA uh, is a law that says the institutions that you attend may share information with parents if they claim them as independent on their most recent tax return. Thank you. <laughs> may. May. So I actually talked to somebody from the Department of Education the other day because I'm like, I'm trying to interpret this. Do institutions have to? Do parents have that right? They don't. It's up to the institution, which is interesting, right? So it's up to the institution. And I understand on both ends, the institution wants the student to grow, to mature, to gain responsibility, to learn how to manage things. 
But there's also that other component of the parent wanting to still be part of the student's life. And again, I go back to forget about the law, do what's right, work as a partnership with your parents, right? And I had a friend who didn't tell me this until after her son graduated uh, from college. They came up with a, a whole system, well, you're gonna take the student loans, I'm gonna help you after you show me your report card. <laughs> right? Yeah. Show me that report card, I'll show you the money or the assistance, right? So, it's an idea. But, again, each institution has their own clarification. And when I was doing my research for this morning, I was looking on web pages for BCC, UMass, Dartmouth, all these. Everybody has something a little different. There are schools that will put right on their website, here's a form for the student to sign, and they can then share everything with you. As a partnership, I don't know that idea, right? Um, but each school has that up to them. So it's kind of an important thing to know. You're going to go on to school so you don't get a surprise, so you can have those conversations with your, your children, or oh, there's still children, and before they go off, to say, what are we going to do? How are we going to work together on this? Because um, parents, what the, what's best for you? Right? So that's all I have, unless you have any questions about FERPA. I just have a quick question, and it applies directly to Diamond. Yes. So at Diamond, I don't know what your policy is actually. So at Diamond, when the students are here in school and they're 18, the parent still has access to the reference. And do you feel that the benefit of that is so much more important than just the grades? So if that your grades or your attendance, those things might be a determination of someone who is having another issue and might throw up a red flag and then you would contact the parent before they're 18. We need parents as partners. Okay. Cool. I do have a handout on, um, and it's just kind of an overview of FERPA and HIPAA. What rights do they protect? On um, you guys are welcome to I'll leave it up here. If anybody was interested in getting a little bit more, if you go to the Department of Education, it's a lot of law and jumble and everything. So it's kind of it's a little difficult to put it. I thought this was a good overview for you to be able to get. And it's actually put up by the CBC. Any other questions about that? Okay. Thank you. And again, everyone will be available at the end. I think with a smaller group today, if you guys are okay with it, when we're going to do that split off thing, is everyone okay with us staying together and everyone will hear from all the college and grant? I love that, so that's good. Um, so next I'm going to bring up uh, Wendy Garfield. Wendy Garfield is from United Neighbors. Um, she's an amazing, amazing partner we have here at Diamond um, in terms of the community work that we're doing. She's going to speak today a little bit about finding that balance between independence and support of my 18-year-old child. Because we know that can be a hard one. And thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for coming. So I have this friend, Eve, who had three children. Her oldest, Ari, skipped a bunch of grades, got accepted to Brown, NYU, was an independent learner. Ben was sort of a nerdy college kid, and now I think he's working on his third PhD or something. And then she had, eight years later, my son. So eight year difference between the kids is almost like having an, you know, an only child. And Michael had some learning issues, and Michael constantly needed support. I taught Michael in first grade and fourth grade, and Eve was the quintessential parent in the classroom. Every class trip, always there for every party, was there to help out, read stories to the kids. And as Micah progressed, Eve was Micah's partner in all of his learning. Micah got accepted to Hampshire College, and he went off, came home Thanksgiving vacation, and showed Eve that he wrote a history paper, and he got a C on it. And Eve read the paper, and said, I think this is better than C. And on her own, made an appointment with the professor, went to Hampshire College, walked in, introduced herself, on my his mom, Eve, I read this paper, I would like you to tell me why he got a C, because I think it deserves more than that. And the professor did this. 
the parental involvement stops. It's really, really hard to take. But there comes a point in time where hands-on parenting, that stage is over. And the point in time when you have to begin to trust that the values you instilled in your children, the education you gave them, is going to help them make the decisions and deal with things in their life. I want to pass this out. This is my little list of, would you have one cousin now? Of how to let go of your child. Okay? So first of all, you have to recognize what are your needs and what are your child's needs. Whose needs was in that story? Whose needs were being a mother? The mother's needs. Did Micah need Eve to go up to Hampshire and talk to the professor? Absolutely not. If he came home, he said he got a C. He probably knows why he got a C. Right? But she had to get involved now. So that's the first thing. How do we figure out what's our need to feel comfortable that you're home by a certain time? Or our need to feel comfortable that you tell me every little part of your life? And what the child's need really is. And you have to set some things. And you have to set some boundaries about this because you have to make sure that you know what those boundaries are. When my son went off to UVM, he'd be gone the whole semester. But when he came home on vacation, we'd be on a dead end street. So I would lie in bed, waiting for him to come home. And I'd hear him pull into the dead end, back into the driveway, and then back again. I'd fall asleep the minute I heard his car back into the driveway. Okay? Then I'd let myself fall asleep. I didn't want him to know that I was up. But all the time he was in UVM, I didn't know what time he came home. I didn't know what he was doing at this time. But he came back to my home, and all of a sudden, I wanted him to be the child he was before he left for college. Motherly instincts. Mo well, motherly instincts, but it's more than motherly instincts. It was my need. It wasn't yeah. his need, and it wasn't our need. Okay? And part of what we have to do is develop the ability for us to work together with our child to make things all right. When we dropped Ezra off at UVM on the prior, I cried in the dorm, I got in the car, I cried in the car, and I kept on crying, and I kept on crying, and about 30 miles into it, finally my husband said to me, you know, you spent your whole life trying to create this independent child, and then you became independent, and you cried your eyes out. You accomplished exactly what you set out to do, right? So. You have to understand that this is a grieving process, too. You're used to having your kid around all the time. And all of a sudden, they're not there. You might need some help with that. You might need some therapy for that. You might need some friend therapy for that. And you might need to recognize that there's grief involved. And you also have to fill the bucket that your child will fulfill. If you spent your whole life raising children, and you're not raising children now, what are you doing instead? Have you developed self-care habits? Have you developed hobbies? Are you going out with your friends? Are you finding a way to fill that void? So let me ask some questions. Stand up if this is you. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you're already standing. You're like, I'm ready. Well, I'm can I tell you, self-awareness is a good thing. Okay? So first of all, what's the greatest fear you have of letting your child go. If your one of your fears is I will let them go too soon, please stand up. Be brave. Come on. Be brave. Okay. If one of your fears is I haven't given my child enough, stand up. If one of your fears is my child is too fragile and not ready for independence, stand up. Good. If something happens, it will be my fault. I need my child in my life. <laughs> I am dependent on the love bond with my child. Okay, so according to this little vanity fair test, which is absolutely the best place to get information, if you stood up for four things, you're in trouble. So none of us are really in trouble. But we have to recognize that self-awareness piece. Are we really too connected to our 18-year-old? And does our 18-year-old feel uncomfortable about that? 
So we have to sort of gauge the way our kids feel about the relationship we have with them. So I know I only have a couple minutes, so I'll open it up if anybody has any questions. Um, all I can talk about is my experiences. I taught in the school where my child went to school from first through eighth grade, and then I was the director of the camp that he went to until he was 13. And then when he went to another camp, I called up the person I did and I said, how's he doing, is he homesick, you know, he'd always been with me. And they told me he was the only child in camp that was not homesick. He was so happy to be away from me because we were so connected. But I also had to learn to step back. I also had to learn when he said, I'm going to a weekend concert, when he called me from college, not to say, who's going, who's driving, what are you taking, when are you coming home, did you look on ways, did you talk to your father, did you have any oil change yet? I had to trust that all those things, somewhere along the line, he learned from us. So best advice is you can't do it without talking, and you can't do it without recognizing that hands-on parenting is done, and it's time for a different kind of parenting that includes a partnership between you and your child. Thanks. Thank you. I'll make sure all the handouts are near the door when you guys leave. Feel free to take extras if you didn't. Um, Wendy will be here till the end, so it's just great to connect with individually. I know a lot of you, when you registered, it was that specific topic came up a lot in terms of what you want to hear more about, so it's just definitely something great to reflect on. Uh, so our next presenter is Sarah Rogers from the Balance Learning Center. And Sarah is another amazing partner for us here at Diamond. And she's going to be reflecting a little bit on um, you know, major transitions in life and how there's a lot in terms of mental health we have to be aware of with major transitions, a lot to do with self-care. And so we're going to have a chat. So I'm going to sit down because we don't have chats. If I'm standing, staring at you, right? Like co conspirator Kayla is coming up here. She doesn't know she is. <laughs> So, um, how many people have functioned on those things? 
What do you feel like when you have no sleep? Terrible. Energetic. Energetic. Surprisingly. You're almost on the opposite end. Yes. Yeah. Like you've gone so far over to the dark side that you're like, forget it. It's over, right? How many people get really crabby with the people around you? Right? Start snapping at people. Right? That's your body's way of saying, hey, you need to slow down and you need to rest. Right? Your mental health is going to treat you in the same way. So we're thinking about mental health. We're going to start talking about mental wellness and not just about health. Okay? So we do all those things to keep our physical wellness up to date. We're going to do all those same things to keep our mental wellness up to date. What do you think of when I say mental health? What comes to mind? Your mood. Your mood. Emotions. Emotions. Your, frame of, your state of mind? The way you deal with your issues. Okay, the way you deal with your issues. How many people start thinking about like certain diagnoses, like, oh, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia, or major depressive disorder, when you start hearing mental health? Sure. Right. Those are the only things that people anxiety. start. That's anxiety. Anxiety. Well, we could talk anxiety all day. <laughs> <laughs> we could be here for that. Right? When People think about it in those terms. When they start thinking of certain diagnoses, they lose the fact that your mental health has to be supported every single day. Not only if you're struggling with a mental health disorder. right? It's gotta be something that we're doing every single day. So we're gonna talk about that. So every single one of you, parents included, are about to embark on a life change. right? Scary, exciting. So some of you are going to make that change in the next year or so. Some of you are going to make that change in the next couple of months. Right? What is it? When you think about it, some of you, this is April, so some of you are going to be leaving in like three or four months for college or the military. Right? Some of you are going to be moving out and going to work. At 18, I absolutely, I think was uh, Ms. Miller, I knew everything at 18, thank you very much, right? And then I quickly realized I knew nothing, absolutely nothing. Okay. So what we're going to do today, because that is a major adjustment in your life for every single one of you, is we're going to give you some tools to put in your toolbox, okay? So you have your shops here at Diamond, you have tools that you use at Diamond, right? Every day in your shops. We're going to give you those same tools to take with you to manage your mental health. Okay? So first thing, we got to prepare ourselves. we got to do a little self-assessment. Right? How right now do you handle change? Right? You don't have to answer that out loud. Start thinking about it. How do you handle change every day? Your schedule gets disrupted. What does that look like for you? I don't know. For those of you that are driving, if you stop and you get coffee on the way to wherever you're going, go to work, right? Kelly's laughing, she's heard me say this before. If you're going and you're stopping at the same Dunkin' every day, and that Dunkin', because hey, we live here in the city, um, if that Dunkin' is closed because of road work, and you're rerouted, what does that do to you? Whole morning, right? You have a favorite Dunkin' for a reason, right? They make your coffee just right. Now you gotta go to a different one. Right? That throws off your whole day. So those changes, you gotta think about how we're handling those, those changes in general. How do you manage stress right now? And yeah, you know what? We talk a lot about kids and how kids and teens, what do you guys have to be stressed about? All the things. They have all the things to be stressed about. Right? But as parents, we look and we're like, you don't know stress until you have to pay your rent. You don't know stress until you have to pay your car insurance. Right? Yeah. You don't know what stress looks like until you've got to fight in line at Market Basket to you know, actually check out. So if you don't know what that looks like, you do. You just have different stressors. So you've got to keep that in mind. Okay? So once we have a little bit of understanding of how we're going to perceive the change that's happening, then we're going to build our toolbox. Okay? So you have it in your mind. Okay, I handle stress really well. I cope with change really well. Most of us are going to kind of fall in the middle. Some of us are going to be like, no, we don't handle that well at all. Right? Bad things happen when we have to change. So we're going to be proactive. So who has a buddy that you go and you work out with, or you go for walks with, or that you do stuff with? You've got a buddy. 
I don't clearly, I'm not working out anywhere, but. Okay, so you've got a buddy that will do fun. Um, you have somebody, teens in your life, that make sure that you stay off of TikTok at like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, get off your phone. We're like, eh, kind of, right? I'm not saying you listen to that. You have a little bit of a support system. So the first thing that's going to go in your toolbox is you're going to make a list. Who are the people in your life that support you? And yeah, you might put parents, you might put caregivers, you might put a teacher, but it's those everyday people that provide you support. Okay? And on that list, we are going to identify how that person actually gives us support. Okay? I tell this story all the time. My mom has not let go, Wendy, at all. Um, Slay the law. So doesn't it go? Doesn't it? Um, she makes me lunch, I'm not kidding you. Like, apparently she thinks I don't know how to do myself. Um, so she always wants to come over and help, all the time, right? So we've got three kids, we're both working full time, we're running around all over the place, and she wants to come and help. Her version of helping is doing my laundry. That is not helping, because for me, I actually find doing my laundry kind of comforting in a weird way. It is the one time that my children go off and kind of do their own thing, right? I can put on a podcast, I can put on an audio book, yes, I'm an epic nerd, I can listen to music, and no one is going to bother me while I'm doing the laundry. My version of support, what I need for my mother, is maybe cooking a meal, which she does do, but it's cooking a meal, or taking one of the kids out for a little bit, right? That would be support for me. So everybody on that list plays a different I'm going to call Kayla when I need to vent and I need somebody to validate how I'm feeling about something. Right? I'm going to ask my husband for support about very task-oriented things. Right? His wife is a therapist. He doesn't do well with emotions. Right? So we're going to put that on our list. What is this person going to be able to do? How are we going to contact them? Right? Do they do better if we contact them by text, by email? Do we call them? Does anyone call people anymore? <laughs> so we're going to make that list. We're going to put it in our toolbox. And that list is going to be essential when you guys are off and you're being independent and you're doing your own things. I'm sure that our recent grads can tell you that they've got a list of people that they know who to call or who to text, right, when things are going a little bit haywire or you just need a little extra, a little extra love in that day. Okay? So we're going to be self-aware. We're going to kind of have an understanding of how we operate, and then we're going to figure out who fills that need in our lives. Okay? So another nugget. Um, we're going to talk about being yourself. How corny is that? Right? You guys have been told your entire lives to just be yourself. Right? I can't tell you how essential that is, especially now that we're moving into the next phase of your life. High school's not real life, right? It's not, right? This is a controlled environment, right? The rest of the world doesn't look like this. I do think Diamond does a better job of creating an environment that mimics more real life, but it's still not real, right? You have adults telling you where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there, what you're supposed to dress like, right? when and where you can use your phones, when you're going to eat, right? when you're going to go to the bathroom, you have other people that are controlling that for you right now. That's all going to change. If you're sitting in a college class, you're going to get up to use the bathroom when you need to. And you're probably not going to tell anybody. Right? You're just going to get up, you're going to walk out, you're going to do your thing, you're going to come back. You're likely going to roll out of bed and go to class. My college students, they're like, yeah. everyone put me in the front. <laughs> Right? When you're going to work, yes, you are going to have people that are going to tell you what to do and how to do it because you're at a job, but you still have a lot more autonomy. Being yourself looks very different in high school than it does out in the real world. Okay? So this is your time that we really have to think about what are those vulnerable spots for us. Right? We have kind of these two sides of ourselves. We have the sides that we show everybody else, and we have the sides that we kind of hide from other people because maybe we're not too comfortable with those yet or we haven't really addressed those parts of ourselves yet, right? It doesn't mean they're bad, right? 
maybe it's like a major BTS addiction, right? Like we're all over Korean uh, K-pop, right? Like maybe that's what it is. And you don't want to let anybody know. Maybe it's that you're really into anime, right? Like that's your thing. And you just haven't let anybody know because you're not sure how other people are going to respond. These are the things that are going to help you connect with other people. Right? I say all the time, be you, they'll adjust. Right? Like other people are going to figure it out. So being yourself is really the piece that you have to be super comfortable with. People are going to criticize you. That is going to happen. Absolutely. If you are uncomfortable with parts of yourself, right, and people criticize that part, your response is going to be so much bigger. But if you're feeling really secure in who you are, right, whether that's about how you dress, how you sound, how you learn, um, what your sexual orientation is, what your nationality is, what your culture brings to the table, right? I grew up in a super Portuguese household. We got lots of issues, right? <laughs> but if you don't embrace those people, uh, those parts of yourself, other people are going to be able to hit on those spots. It's going to hurt a lot more, right? That doesn't mean that you're going to brace yourself. No, you're just going to learn how to embrace every part of you, right? So being yourself is a huge part of your toolbox. That's going to help make that transition. That's going to help you figure out where you're going to fit in, okay? Another nugget, self-care. What comes to mind when I say the word self-care? Take a shower. Take a shower. Hygiene. Hygiene. Massages. Stop taking all the good answers. Sorry. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> People often say things like bubble baths and getting your nails done and all those kinds of things. And yeah, you know, those things are nice. You know, massage is plenty. I would love to be able to get a massage, right? That truly would be a piece of self-care. But it's more than that. Self-care includes the hard stuff. Making a doctor's appointment. Showing up for class when you don't feel like it. Getting an assignment done not 10 minutes before you're supposed to hand it in. Right? Those pieces are self-care, and that is a skill. Adults, I think, hate talking about self-care because we're not really good at it. We go up and we have you guys, right, as children, and we're like, ooh, our whole world is now embracing these children, and we forget that we have to take care of ourselves too. So when it comes to teaching you guys how to take care of yourselves, yeah, we're not good at it. We're pretty bad at it, actually. So we've got to think about those things when we're out in the world and everything is moving so fast so loud and it's so intense and we're like, oh my gosh, I don't even know where to start right now. Okay, so self-care. Um, other thing about self-care is you've got to listen to yourself. So when you're ready to say no, you say no. Say no. no. That's right. I was just going to raise my hand because that thing and, and I think for both the young people and the older people, it is setting our own boundaries of when when somebody's asking us to go out the night before this big exam, this important exam, and you know what the best thing is for you is your ability to say no. <laughs> Not always easy. And as parents and adults, looking at when everybody's asking us for things, being able to say, no, nope, not this time. I need to take care of myself. There are nice ways to do that. Like, well, most of the time we feel guilty about saying no, but we can give you some scripts to just fall back on, right? We, I rely on scripts all the time because that helps me be able to say, I say yes to things before I even realize I said yes. I go, yeah, sure. And then I go, what did I just do? <laughs> do it all the time. We've got to get in the mindset that it's okay to say no and it's not something that we need to feel guilty for. Somebody asks you to go hang out, uh, you're, 20, you're 21, and you're out at a bar, and somebody asks you to stay out, right? And it's like now 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. You're closing this place down, but you've got to be up for work at 7. How's that going to work out for you? No. Might be funny the first couple of times, right? But when you're showing up late and unable to do your job, it's not funny anymore. Right? If you're in the military and you've got to be up for drills, <coughs> being out at the bar the night before doesn't seem like such a good idea, right? Or staying up and binge watching 
you know, whatever. I don't even know what kids watch. I haven't watched anything that's beyond the Disney Channel at this point. So, you know, if you're up kids watching stuff, that's going to be a problem too. So one more little nugget, <coughs> so we can hear from our folks on not sick. Um, social media. So the DA talked to you a little bit about social media, right? What do we think of? <coughs> Sorry, something's in my throat. What do we think of when we hear of social media? What good comes from it? Nothing. <laughs> Who disagrees with the nothing? Who agrees with nothing? I'm on the fence, right? Sometimes it's nothing, sometimes it's, hey, <coughs> it's in the air. Social media can be really good, right? It can help you catch up with people. What else can it do for you? Connect you with other people with similar interests and connect you on not just the social media, but like different events and things that you might want to participate in. So for thinking college and work, like networking, right, is a great way to do social media. Um, you can follow your favorite celebrities. Who do people follow now? I don't even know. I'm a nerd and I follow John John Smith right now. Kids will tell me things about like, you know, like YouTube people and I'm like, I don't know who that is. And they look at me and I'm like, Kids should tell us who you follow. Come on, guys. Who do you follow? Who do I need to be? Who do you follow? Who do you follow? Uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I use social media. All right. Sam, is, is, is he telling the truth? <laughs> you want my phone? <laughs> <laughs> Stop thinking too much. They follow our games. Gamers. Yeah. My 13-year-old follows a bunch of gamers, and I'm like, why are we watching people play video games? <laughs> and they make money off of that, which is like shocking to me, but whatever. Um, we do think you could find things to support your mental health, too, right? There's a lot of TikTok therapists, which be careful of, right? Just going to do that little PSA right there. Um, but you might find stuff that makes you feel good, puppy videos. Oh, yeah. videos, okay. <laughs> but social media can also suck you in to this place of you are paying more attention to the relationships that you have in your home instead of the relationships you have in your life. Okay. <coughs> so best way to handle that, give yourself a schedule. You're not going to check it first thing in the morning. That's actually a horrible way to start your day. Set times during the day that you're going to check social media. Limit the accounts that you're following. If there's an account that makes you feel bad, delete it. Right? If there's an account that when you look at it, you're constantly comparing your real life to that account's highlight reel, because let's face it, who posts truly hard stuff on social media? Who in this room posts the hard parts about your life all the time on social media? Nobody does. Right, we love some people too. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's and right. then I like tell other people to comment <laughs> and on your stuff. <clears throat> but for the most part, people don't do that, right? And then you're, you see how I just reacted? We're like, oh, some people do do that, right? That was a pretty negative reaction. People do this all the time, right? They'll post their dirty laundry, but for the most part, people are only showing the shiny, happy parts of their lives, and you're comparing your real life to that person's highlight reel. It doesn't make sense. It creates this weird disconnect. It makes you feel really bad about yourself. Okay? You're going to see a lot of that in college. You're going to see a lot of that in work. So um, I'm going to give you one quick tip. Can I just say something? Yes. Yeah. I did, um, yes. I did um, something at chart school a couple years ago. Just so you know, people will look up your social media accounts. Oh, 100% they will. Yep. But I know I've been at meetings where we're looking at job applicants, and we're like, pull it up, and we pull up the screen, and some of the things are so embarrassing. So, and I know it's petty, but people do it. People want to know, like, what you're involved in, what your views are, what kind of crap you're going to post, because if you're going to be posting that freely, you're going to be a reflection of the company. So don't ever think they won't look at your stuff just because you have freedom of speech, and this is 
my private life. You do have, have the right to all of that. 100%. But it will affect how people see you and potentially hire you. And I've told my son to come back as far as I think 14 years old. Yeah. So just because you're like, um, Mr. Quinn said, you know, when you're 18, you're an adult, they can go back as, as far as 14. And I mentioned that when we were on a college um, tour. Uh, just be very mindful of what you post the the shots, the boys acting silly. And I, not that it's giving you anything, I to just point out girls. But I mean, even boys will post things, maybe inappropriate things of girls. Just know that it will reflect on your character. So if you do it just to impress people, be mindful. We will blow it up on the screen when we're looking through our When you were going to say Well, there's a famous case in Connecticut about 10 years ago before the legalization of marijuana in Connecticut, where there was a teacher in one of the public schools in Cheshire, Connecticut, and a picture came up of when she was in college standing with a whole bunch of kids in somebody else's dorm room with a marijuana plant in the back of the picture, and she was fired for moral turpitude. It wasn't her room, it wasn't her plan, she didn't post it, but she lost her job. So we're not saying any of that is right? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just letting you know that they, I think it's terrible, but because sometimes, you know, you're involved in something, or you just happen to be in a place, and off to the side, something else happened, but because you were there, now you're wrangled up in it, so just be mindful that people will look up your social media accounts. So. And right or wrong, that's why it's called social media, mm -hmm. because you might not even be the person who just directly involved. They don't even give homework, Jason. If they don't like something that you post, they will report us. And stuff on as a lead engineer. And he almost lost his job like 35 years because it was just public news. So this is real life. <laughs> I need to get Debbie down. Just saying. No, no, it's I did just want to say something really quick. And it's a little bit of a jump back, but also incorporates some other things that more than one speaker has talked about. I was definitely super mom when my kid was growing up, right? Took care of everybody, juggled everything. My husband traveled for business. When my son went to college, I was not, we, we were completely involved in the process of him getting into the college that he wanted. And then from then on in, there was really nothing I could do about that. And, you know, I actually liked that part. <laughs> and I think there's probably some people in this room who also like it. But, but the other part of it was, then I didn't know his schedule, and I didn't need to micromanage it, and I had so much more time for myself. Sometimes that was a good thing, and sometimes it was not. Sometimes I didn't feel like myself because my goals had been changed. But boy, I was able to embrace that in a short minute. But he was in Boston for four years, and he lived in his own apartment in Boston, Chiching, for two years, and certainly we communicated over that time. He wasn't my little boy, and I was not going to take care of him that way because I was all used to my independence. <laughs> it's not his independence, my independence. And so when he came home, uh, especially now because he's done and who can even rent an apartment, so he's, he lives with us. I like him. He's a cool guy, so that's fine. But um, I had already said to him, you don't need to run a household. You just need to know how to live with other people. Okay, that's what you need to do. That's a big part of the transition. Is you live, you're your only child, and blah, blah. But the best thing about us all being in the same house now is we are all on the same plane, in my opinion. I'll say to him, well, how was your day? And my husband, how was your day? We don't sit down and talk over the, the, the dinner table. We never got to do that. But how was your day? But now my son will be like, hey, mom, how about that? He'll ask me when I get home. How'd that go tonight? Were you happy with it? You know, did, did a lot of people come? He's actually interested in my life, but that was a process of treating him, that came through the process of treating him like the adult that he returned as. Is he always going to be my kid? Yes, he is. Do I like to make breakfast? Yes, I do. But when it comes to his personality and the things that he has done in the last four years that I have never done, you got to give the kid his props, right? I mean, lived in Boston, we walked through the Chinatown streets to get to class at 10 p.m. Yeah. So I feel like that's a transition for everyone, students, parents, and I really think it started with how you did today. And it's just so normal now in our house that we all ask each other, how'd that go? Or if I'm complaining, they'll say, wow, that's terrible. Not like, we talk about this, you know, so I think it, I think it makes a, those small efforts really do cost. I think they really do.
Kelly Dewart, I'm going to bring it way back to class of 1997. <laughs> 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 um, health careers, I went on to Diamond School of Practical Nursing. I graduated when I was like 18 or 19. Um, and then I'm a senior um, this year, 2022. He's in um, Auto Technologies, and we're both graduating. I just finally went back to school to finish my RN, so I graduate in two weeks from Sistema. Awesome. Awesome. So, obviously, different backgrounds. So, I'm going to kind of pick in parts of them because I know them so, so well. I think where I want to start off with is like, let's just hit it right in the face. What were things that we sort of said, these are the things that you wish you had known when you were in their shoes as you were now into the other side of life? Can right? you just clarify? I'm yes. not going to give my experience because this is too good. <laughs> yes. My experience as a parent of a graduate. Okay. Absolutely. Make sure I'm not like so, trying to reminisce about my high school career. So <laughs> I, I'm going to kind of bounce it around a little bit. So I'll, I'll start off with this. What were some of the things that they wish they had known, like legitimately, and things that had happened that were challenges? So I'll start off with Ariana because I just love to kind of torch Ariana a little bit. Uh, I don't know why, but let's go from there. Um, I feel like my things now have changed from from when I was in high school. But if, if I were thinking me in high school, the things that I, I wish I had known prior. Um, they're simple things. I think they sound so simple, but they really are what they are. I think be a good human. Those are things that, that you lose almost, I find, along the way. You go to college, you get new friends, you, you have new clips, you have you know a new vision for yourself. You try to even sometimes change yourself for this new version of you that you want to create. And I think that to your core, you know who you are now. Um, those values that you have, that your parents give you, that your teachers and administrators <laughs> give you, they come, they come to circle back all the time in life. And you find yourself sitting there and you think about all the things that they told you prior, that you lost along the way. But I think genuinely to your core, I wish I had always just kept that in the back of my mind that you know who you are. You know who you are. You know that you're a good human. You know the difference between right and wrong. I think if you keep that so, you know, in your heart, in your head, every day of your life, I think you'll never, you know, have have a, have a wrong path or have have that big of an issue in your life where you're like, oh my God, I've lost myself. I've lost my way. I think those values don't don't leave. I would have always. I, for sure, I wish I had paid more attention to those things. I'm going to jump to Laurel with the same question because Laurel I was so busy in high school trying to be everything and everything <laughs> and everywhere. Um, Laurel I, your thoughts on what you wish you had went back and said, okay, I would have been here too or whatever it may be? Yeah. Um, Diamond provided me with like the most amazing options and opportunities while I was here. I just graduated in June, so it's still very recent. Um, the values that I learned at Diamond and from my parents and everything, like, really proved themselves when I went to college because um, in college everyone is from a different background, everybody came from a different place, everyone has different experiences, everyone's at a different level, whether it's in life, in their education, things like that. And it's so important to not compare yourselves to other people because it's so easy to go into a class, go into a study group and be like, why does this person just get it and I don't? Or you go and you're in a club and you're like, oh, this person like has so much more experience than me, or like, like all over the place, like everyone's from a different experience, different background. So really working on not comparing yourself to them. And also, you have a different identity when you go to college. In high school, I was the girl that was always involved. I was in Skills USA, like, oh, I was the try hard, whatever it was. But like, you go to college and nobody knows that about you. And like, it is, uh, she talked about like kind of reinventing yourself a little bit, like your identity will change a bit because you're in a new place, you're in new, with new people, you're growing outside of your comfort zone because it's not, if you go outside of your hometown, you're with new people, you kind of have to, you change and find who you really are and not just based on how everyone wants you to be. I'm going to kind of jump to another question because I want to keep laboring the point with the same question once you guys kind of get there. Uh, I'm going to jump over to my to the two gentlemen in the crowd where they went to the training. The reality for them were quite different because they did go right to work. So, Aiden, talk about a little bit about that. Okay, now you're working full time. Fall hits, and you know what? For 18 years or whatever your educational career was, all of a sudden that fall hit. You're not you didn't go back to school. So, talk about you know the challenges you face as a full time worker. 
obviously you want to co-op you can share some light uh, shed some light on that for the students in the crowd that are going to trade the trade. Uh, I definitely say it is a pretty big responsibility. You know, for me, for instance, I wake up like 4.30 every day, no matter what, every day, just 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, then you get into that habit of waking up at 4.30. The fact that you're able to go to a job every day is awesome, and like, I don't know. <laughs> Neil, you want to jump in? Yeah. yeah. One, one of my biggest things with working that I've learned is do what you love. Because if you don't like it, it's going to get real old really quick. And diamond, like, co-op is a great thing that kind of lets you dip your toe in the water and make sure that you, this is the path I want to go, you know? And if you don't, one thing I can say is don't follow the money. The money will come later. Do what you love, get good at it, and the money will come once you're good at it. And, and to jump into the co-op piece of it, why I still love and passion about it, and I don't go too far about it, is that it's not about the money. Yeah, they make money. It, it's about the opportunity. It's about that grit that our kids lack these days for a whole host of reasons. And that we uh, have heard as, as, as a collective group here from you know, Sarah and her people and before that, where we have to let go. As your child is going into the world of work, education, so on and so forth, it's a scary thought. So I'm going to speak to my parents. Legally speaking, okay, as an HR perspective, you no longer, as an employee, have rights to your child's information. So if you called company A and you said, hey, I want to know, you know what happened to my son, they can literally just say to you, I appreciate the call, however, we're not literally to disclose any employee information, but he's my son. Let me try this one more time. And that's what you get. By the way, over yet, seven, the second your child works, part-time or otherwise, by law, they're not required to provide you anything. And by the way, by them providing information, they're breaking the law. Just kind of a quick tidbit on that, because I think parents want to help, and I get it, and I hear employees tell me what some parent call, and you know, I'm in this position where I want to say stuff, but keep that in mind as you segue out, as you turn 18, as you move on. It already happens before that, to be quite honestly. Can I throw my two cents in on that? Yes. Because I'm good at it anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we post a boatload of interns over, over at the center, the center. When you can attest to that, we had 20 this year. I have, on occasion, had parents call to try to secure their, their student an internship. Now keep in mind, these are more, more, than, uh, more often than not master's level students. So they're like 22, 23 at like minimum. And I have parents call, and I can tell you that I immediately say no, immediately. Because if you don't demonstrate the skill set to try to initiate your own internship, I don't have time for that. There'll be none of that. So sometimes you're actually doing your kid a disservice by calling that person by calling the school to try to get some information. Because you're making it look like your child can't do that. And then people like us go, yeah, no. Not Can I add on to that? Um, I try to have a really good communication with my son, and I encourage him to talk to him as well as I anything he has. We do um, talk about situations that might arise at work. I've mentioned at other uh, forums that I feel like sometimes our children are at risk of being exploited because they die new students. You hear on talk radio people call, why can't die new kids do it? And why can't we do this? And I try to engage them in scenarios with what do you do if they ask you to stay later and not be compensated? Uh, make sure you ask to be either compensated financially or with time off. Um, I would never ever call a place of employment. I think it makes one, you look crazy, and it makes the child look incompetent and like maybe they haven't done enough and then they don't look employable. Um, and I just say, if you need to, just go over scenarios with your child. Mm -hmm. really act out. With Sharon. Right. I think it's good to ask them, like, well, what would you say if this happened? And what do you think we should do? Do you think that's not Mr. Lazaro, like my son ran into a situation? Wait, he's probably not going to, he's not going to be employed after June. And they've mentioned that very freely to him, that they're looking for the newbie. And he's passed it along to Mr. Lazaro, so just FYI. It's a great job, but if people want it long term, send people on the way go to college there, otherwise it's going to be, it's a dead end job, which is fine if you don't mind going to something else. It all serves its purpose, and obviously you want to be here. Right, right. context, I'm here. Obviously after you graduate, it's different. I'm going to say, wait, wait, no, no worries. I just want to let them know that you're available. Oh, I'm always available. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump over to Alexis, because I, I, I like Alexis' story, because she went on traditional route as a Lorelei, you know, um, but I'm going to have her talk about kind of her journey and some of her experiences where she's at in her life right now, if you don't mind, Alexis. Okay. Um, let me 
one thing for sure, because we're like from parents and there's students here. So my dad is my dad was a military guy when I was growing up, and it was like he is very like nurses' corners on the bed every day, helicopter parent, fixes everything for me. And when I kind of was like ending high school, I was like, okay, dad, I need to do it. I was like, I need to do it by myself. But like, you have to have that understanding, or I was like, dad, I'm gonna do this, but I'm gonna talk to you about it. I don't, he doesn't have access to my college stuff. I go to UMass Dartmouth right now. But he knows if he asks me, I'll show him. If he asks me, hey, how's this class going? I'll show him. He knows what classes I'm enrolled in. He knows everything. I pay my own tuition, but he knows what's going on with the bill. He knows what's going on with everything. And it's kind of like an understanding. If I'm going to study late, he knows. He's like, okay, but I want you home for dinner. He's like, you have to be home for dinner, but you can do whatever you want. You have to come back. Like We have a mutual understanding where it's something that works for both of us. And it takes a lot of the stress off because it's like I'm not worried about him being upset with me. He's not, I live at home still, which is a good thing I should have said before that. I don't. I go to school like 10 minutes away from my house, so it's very much like, okay, I'm not going away to college, but I'm still an adult. I'm like, you need to like trust me, and I'm going to communicate with you. And that's a big thing because if you don't, then it's kind of like it causes like a drift. And I was so afraid of that because I only have my dad, and I was like, Dad, I was like, give me a break, but like. I was like, don't go away. I'm not like moving out, but like you have to like let me do things. And yeah, so I'm one of like three other girls in my class right now. And you know, I always have been because non-traditional, it's kind of like, you know, you stand out, it's like you're the only other people there when it's a room full of men and like two other women with you. And you know, sometimes it's intimidating, but also I've just kind of accepted that um, you know, it's like it's okay to stand out, it's okay to do things. And I know this will be no surprise to Ms. Lozaro. This is a very fleeting moment to admit, but my biggest issue has been not saying no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I graduated here and I was like, I'm done. I'm going to say no to everything. I was like, I'm going to do the bare minimum and I'm going to get away with it and I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it and I'm just going to do get in class and I'm not going to do extra. And I got there and I'm in three different clubs. I'm on every different board. I'm doing everything. And I was like, what am I doing? I was like, you'd be so disappointed. <laughs> I said no. I said no. I was like, I'm not going anymore. I stopped going. You have to do what's good for you. When I started worrying, I was like, I have an exam tomorrow, but I have a club meeting until 8 o'clock tonight. And I live, I have to go home. I have to do everything. I was like, I can't go. I had to say no. And it was surprisingly very easy. I don't know why I didn't do that sooner. <laughs> well, I want to jump in. Yeah, if I could just touch on that, kind of continue. So, same boat. <laughs> or it's not like two e boards in college, but it's fine. <laughs> Um, but like college, at college is an experience. You're there to go to school. Like studying and getting your degree is your number one priority. But it is a balance. You want to get involved with things. You want to make new friends. You want to have fun. You want to go out, make new experiences. And that like it's supposed to be a balance. If you're gonna go to college and pay all that money to just like sit in your dorm all day and do your homework, like it's not worth it. Because college is a time for growth and to try new things and to meet new people and find where you really fit in this world and what people you fit with. So one of my biggest pieces of advice that even I talk to my friends about a lot is um, try new things. And like, it's not just like, oh, try new types of alcohol, like go to a new party. Like, <laughs> no, like actually try new things. Like I went ice fishing for the first time. I went and I hiked mountains with my friends. I have an opportunity to go to Spain this summer. So getting yourself involved and having these new experiences that you would have never had before, college is the time for that. On a theme of no, I want to hear from Neil, who works in the industry, obviously, Aiden. What's that like when you have to sit there and you know tell your boss no, or your colleague no, or the owner of the company no? What's that like, Neil? So I was, luckily, when I was originally started working, I worked for a very small company doing uh, gas distribution pumps, and he taught me a very rare portion of the trade, which then a bigger company, Mass Power Solutions, bought us out and signed my contract to go work for them and kind of said, hey, you're like one of three electricians that know how to do this. You now run your own crew. Uh, so now I get given responsibilities and sometimes, yeah, saying no is very hard where I, I can't just one day wake up and say, I don't feel like going into work today because I have 10 guys waiting to be set up to know what they're going to do in the morning. So it does get a little hard to do that sometimes, to find more personal time for myself, but at the same time, the responsibility, I, I kind of do like it. It makes you grow. It teaches you that, you know, adult life is sometimes hard, scary, but it lets me, I don't know how to describe it, um, feel more independent, if that's a way of putting it. 
it's rewarding in a sense. But it is very nice. It is. And, and, and the point is, like you hear, like you know, a lot of times where our kids, we sit here and we say, okay, check the boxes and you'll be okay. And like, okay, and okay, and look, my two kids are right there. Alright? And I'll tell you a story about them. Don't touch the soap. Ah, uh, don't touch the soap. That's it. Anarchy ensues. And when anarchy ensues, it goes, <laughs> you chose anarchy, you figure it out. You know, and that's how it goes because I have to teach my kids and it's, it's hard because I love them. I mean, but we have to also learn with our own children when it happens now, what's happening, that they have to learn. It's hard, it's risk, it's scary, it should be scary. It needs to be scary because you're going to pay attention. You know, you're going to watch those little steps there. And I'm going to kind of segue back to when you do buck that trend, what it looked like. Because Ari, Ari was going to share a little bit about her life, hopefully, where she did buck that trend. And some of her choices led to down some different roads. So Ari, I talk about living independently. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very honest. I'm going to be very honest. I'm, I really am, because I feel like it's important to be honest. I, I wouldn't say I'm the opposite of probably Lorelei, but I would say in a way, kind of. Um, I was more worried about probably the things not to be, not to be, you know, treat as important. I was targeted to the parties. I loved. I love the social light of high school. I love the social light of college. My first year, I went to Rick, um, and I'm going to be honest, I failed out. My first year, I failed out. Completely bombed. The first semester, walked in, didn't pass a class. Um, and I have a $20,000 loan that I am still paying for nothing. I got nothing out of that. I got a couple parties. I actually got myself in a really not good situation with a relationship. Nothing good came out of that, financially, emotionally. Um, and that was a wake-up call. That was a wake-up call, and I came home. And for the last three years, I've been home. This, this most recent year, I've, I've moved out, and I have my own place now, and it's different. Um, but um, I came home, and I, I kind of had to wake up and remember that this is real life. College is like a vacation. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's so much fun and you're on your own and you think that you know everything. Every, I'm talking, you think you know your ins and outs of everything that's gonna happen and you don't. Um, and people, as you get older, I think now that I'm in a place where I have my own apartment and I'm independent and I tried so hard for so long to have so many friends or have so many people like me in a way that I've gotten to this place where nobody pays my bills but me. Nobody wakes me up in the morning but me. Nobody tells me to pass the class that I don't really want to go pass. They don't do it anymore. Um, Mr. Lazaro doesn't tell me to get my stuff together in a better sense anymore. He doesn't. He doesn't, I don't walk into school and he's like, you need to, you know, and I'm like, oh, I, I'm by myself. I wake up, I'm, it's just me. Um, and it's really, really hard to get to that place, I think, especially now that I'm, I'm, I'm at this age. I think it's so hard and you lose track of that. Um, but I definitely didn't do it the right way. I definitely lost myself a thousand more times. And I actually had a really hard time with my parents through it. That was the hardest part about it. We, we had to go through a lot of therapy. We had to go through a lot of things because, again, I thought I knew everything. And I thought my parents were wrong. And I felt like at times it was, you're too much, you're too little, you're too this, you're too that. I know I need to go. And every time that I would let them go, Every time I would let them go, and they got to that place where it was like, okay, you want to do it by yourself, do it by yourself. That's fine. We wipe our hands clean. You know everything. You can do it. Um, it was like walking just downstairs every time I did that. It was like, okay, bye, I'm going to do me. And another problem would happen, and then I'd call them. I'd call my mom, and it was the infamous phone call. I'm like, I'm really sorry to bother you. Uh, I really need help. And she was like, she would laugh and she would get mad and she'd be like, oh, but like two minutes ago you were just telling me that you knew everything, that you knew how to do it. And I'd be like, well, I still need you to like 
you know, help me out. How do I make the doctor's appointment? How do I, how do I get this oil change done? I don't know what this means. And she'd be like, yeah, you don't know like anything of what you're talking about, but you think you do. Um, and you just, you have to like really, it, it's so hard to get over that. But like, you don't know everything. It's, it's not fun to know that. This is what a humbled student is. I know, is like. <laughs> and I was not humbled. I was not before. I really, really, I used to like fight with, I, I swear, not fight, but I used to be like, no, I'm right. Like, I know I'm right. Like, you're wrong. And now it's so opposite. The one thing I'm going to so say, you are so right. <laughs> you are so right. Hold well, on, that's on film, right? <laughs> oh, let us look. So, Ariane, I want to just say, so you, you said you were going to you know, it didn't go the right way. Mm -hmm. There is no one right way. For you, where you're at right now, that was, the right that was the right way. Look at where you're at right now. So I think that's really important to think about. There is no one right way. And, and, and I'm glad you said that because I was going to harp all over that. Like, look, we can all sit up here and talk about child, challenges, you know, trials and tribulations. I mean, I can get up here and Probably the detain you or boy, you, but you know, I'm not supposed to be here. But you know what? The main point of it is as you go through life and as you start to fail, succeed, fail, you gotta have that resiliency to get up and get out there. And our students here right now, in the pandemic, because we weren't here, we lost that element of giving that, you know, programming them with that. And it's a little scary for this group, I'm not gonna lie, because they didn't have that programming to they had a whole different experience from high school to no fault of their own. To no fault of their own. And that's the part that leaves me awake at night and then I go and I, I, I'm sitting there like, like, like I'm, I'm so fearful because life will treat you harshly but life can be great too and there's a lot of success with it without, without trials and tribulations every one of them I can say and I can pick out each one of them about their trial Alexis could not say no I would say just practice saying no she's like oh, I can't disclose I said say no oh, I can't and she's like say no and she's like no and you know, I still say yes she still say yes but, you know, there's so much to capture here, and I'm trying to take the conversation with everybody in this room. You know, it is a scary thing. You know, it is a scary thing to be a parent. You know, I'm scared to death every single day when, I, when I'm with my kids, because am I doing the right things? Am I saying the wrong things? I don't know. It can only be me. And if I'm good to myself, then I'm good to others. And if I'm not, then I'm not. And that's no good to everybody else. Okay? Um. I just want to talk to the parents a little bit. Um, my son is going a different route. He's going to go, he actually is a little bit of a mix of both. He's going to do some college, but it's a trade related. He's going to go to a diesel program in Connecticut. So he's going to live away, but close enough that he can come home on the weekends and still work and do his things he needs to do. Um, he is 18. Um, I actually, my parents are extremely strict. My husband's parents couldn't kill us if he came home. So we both together have to have like a little bit of a balancing act. I might not wait up for him when he, until he gets home. My husband will sl sleep on the couch till he does. I'm like, I'm at work. I'm working the overnight shift. I told him to call me when he gets home. He's like, but I can't sleep until he gets home. I said, well, that's on you. Because I'm literally awake. He'll call me when he gets home. Um, so it is like a little bit of give and take. Um, we do butt heads sometimes with our son. Uh, it is hard to see them because they no longer a child. They're 18 years old. He goes out. As long, all I ask is, if you're not going to be home at a certain time, just let me know more or less. So I don't start panicking until that. I don't give any thought about where he is. I know that sounds awful, but he has to make the choices himself. Obviously, I care. I ask him, where are you going? And do you have, make sure your phone's charged. Um, if he's not home by 10, that's not really his curfew. It's just a guideline. Tell me where you are at 10 o'clock. And to be honest, there's really nothing going on after 10. My mother used to say that to me. Anything, everything's usually shut down. There's no good going to come out after the out of midnight. Really, there's nothing to do. Um, the other thing with school, he is, I'm trying to get him into the mindset of um, something simple like a book every day, write an agenda book. What you have to do, because that's how I get through my day, because my memory is. So I write down literally everything I need to do that day. I try not to stress. I cross things out as I go. And when I don't get done, I move to the next day. And I try to. Trying to get him to make that habit because he was going to go live with three other people. He said he likes on his college thing. He says he likes to. Um, he's a clean person. I said you are clean as long as someone you like living in a clean house, but you don't like to be going to clean it. So, so you should have been more specific. So this summer, 
I said, once I finish school, we're really going to work on getting, you need to be a good roommate. Because I said, if you come home because you are a lousy roommate, there's going to be problems. Um, but the other thing my husband and I have talked about is you can't want it more than they do. You can talk to them until you're blue in the face. You can want them to be successful. You can want them to do things. But they have to want it. And like she said, you know, I'm just going to harp on you. She's very honest. She's very honest about her her situation. And I'm prepared for him to fall on his face. I don't plan on rubbing his nose in it. But it's, he's going to have to learn certain things. And things have come up now when he's he got into a car accident, no fault of his own. It was a weather thing. And I'm like, okay, now you have to write a check to the insurance company.